Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're delighted to be here tonight with Catherine Knight Steele and Moya Bailey to celebrate digital Black feminism. We're also joined by the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African-American culture and history to help us celebrate this exciting book. Um, this is a bit of a mirror of an event we held uh, last year, and I'm really excited to get to do this. I'm glad it came to fruition despite COVID and everything else. We're really, really excited to get to be here. So I'll introduce Moya Bailey first. Uh, Moya is an associate professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University. Her work focuses on marginalized groups' use of digital media to promote social justice, and she's interested in how race, gender, and sexuality are represented in media and medicine. She is the digital alchemist for the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network and the board president of Allied Media Projects, a Detroit-based media movement organization that supports an ever-growing network of activists and organizers. She is the co-author of Hashtag Activism, Networks of Race and Gender Justice, as well as, and the author of Message Noir Transformed, Black Women's Digital Resistance, which came out from NYU Press in 2021. So welcome, Moya. We're really glad you're here. Glad to be here. And the person of the hour today is Catherine Knight Steele, who is an associate professor of communication at the University of Maryland College Park and was the founding director of the African American Digital Humanities Initiative. She now directs the Black Communication and Technology Lab as a part of the Digital Inquiry, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism Network, funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Her research focuses on race, gender, and media with a specific emphasis on African-American culture and discourse in traditional and new media. She examines representations of marginalized communities in the media and how groups resist oppression and practice joy online, using online technology to create spaces of community. Catherine's research on the Black blogosphere, digital discourses of resistance and joy, and digital Black feminism has been published in such journals as Social Media Plus Society, Information, Communication, and Society, and Feminist Media Studies. She is the author of Digital Black Feminism, which examines the relationship between Black women and technology as a centuries-long gendered and racial project in the United States. So we are really excited. This book technically came out in October of last year, but we are celebrating it now. Turns out that was a good a good call for lots of reasons. So we're, we're glad uh, and glad to have all of you watching um, with us at home tonight. So if you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the ask a question tab, which is at the bottom center-ish of your screen. Uh, we also love it if you shout out where you're watching from in the chat. Let us know if you know either of these folks. Feel free to say hi um, and make yourselves at home. But welcome to you both. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Catherine, it's so good to see you and be doing this. Ooh, it's been so long. <laughs> it's been so long. It's been so long. So I wanted to start with just uh, a land acknowledgement, given that we are, again, in this digital world that is so strange. And um, I am joining you all from the traditional unceded homeland of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nations. And I was really moved by a non-land acknowledgement in which Indigenous elders made clear that land acknowledgements are never enough and that they can be used as a tool to help white supremacy relax. And that's not what we're trying to do here, but I do think that when we have to do work uh, via the interwebs because of COVID, it's really important that we acknowledge kind of where we are located. And your work does such a beautiful job of having us think about who are the people who are actually doing this digital labor. And part of that digital labor that people don't often think about is the actual land yeah. that contains and holds this infrastructure. So I wanted to start start us there and uh, invite you to read uh, a little bit from the book before we get started with a couple of questions that I have, and then we open it up to questions from the audience. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Moy. It's so wonderful to see you and to be here. 
Um, I'm going to read just a little bit from the introduction, um, per Moya's request. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't figure out what to, what to read, so I'll read a little bit um, just to get us started. This is from the introduction for the Black girls who don't code. Books about race are often about Black men. Books about technology are often about white men. And books about feminism are often about white women. This is a book about Black women. Studying Black women is often considered too niche. In the early years of my career, various senior scholars advised me to study Black folks' discourse online by comparing it to whiteness. In graduate school, a faculty member suggested that my dissertation research on the Black blogosphere would be much more interesting if I compared this community of writers to recent European immigrants online. When you decide to center Black folks, Black culture, and Black discourse, this provokes questions of validity and objectivity However, those in the dominant group who study themselves, one, never have to name their work as the study of white folks, and two, are lauded for their work's breadth and broad applicability. As was the case in graduate school when I politely declined that faculty member's placement on my committee, I have little interest in writing a comparative analysis between Black women's use of technology and Black men's or white women's. Instead, in this book, I place Black women at the center of conceptualizing technology and digital culture. I argue that Black women's historical and persistent relationship with technology provides the most generative means of studying the possibilities and constraints of our ever-changing digital world. Founded in 2011 by Kimberly Bryant, Black Girls Code is a nonprofit organization that provides technology education to African-American girls. The group's motto is Imagine, Build, Create. Their website continues, imagine a world where everyone is given the tools to succeed and then help us build ways for everyone to access information and create a new age of women of color and technology. Research demonstrates that programs like Black Girls Code can indeed result in increased leadership, confidence, and self-efficacy. While organizations like Black Girls Code provide critical interventions for Black girls in STEM, I argue that Black girls and women have long possessed the digital expertise necessary for the future. Learning to code is neither a panacea nor the missing tool to usurping the racism that has precluded Black women's technological skills from being recognized by the masses. Reminding us of the profoundly troubling racism and sexism experienced by Black women in Silicon Valley, Alondra Nelson asks, Black girls code and then what? Do we want to send these young women into Silicon Valley to toxic work environments? Further, an overemphasis on coding and programming skills accepts a mythology about Blackness, womanhood, and technology that does not serve Black women and girls. The goals of, black, of digital Black feminism are twofold. The first is that we begin to rightly position Black women online as central to the future of communication technology. By tracing the historical relationship between Black women and technology, I reposition Black women online as purveyors of digital skill and expertise not deficient or in need of new skills to survive a digital changing landscape. Black women without extensive programming experience have already maximized platform affordances, built transmedia platforms, led platform migrations, pushed platform policy changes regarding hate speech and content moderation, and introduced us to new pay structures as precursors to influencer culture. Black feminist writer Lovey Ajayi started her writing career with a blogging platform, Awesomely Lovey, but she's since developed Love Nation, a standalone social media network, and Awesomely Techie, a digital consulting and web strategy firm. Jamila Lemieux, an early adopter of online media, now consults for political campaigns. Kimberly Nicole Foster has shown bloggers how to shift content from the blogosphere to YouTube seamlessly. Mara Lindy is one of the co-founders of Shine, a mental health app that speaks specifically to the experiences of women of color. She writes, imagine all the ideas we're missing, all the ideas we're missing out on because people from more marginalized experiences that are uniquely positioned to solve problems because of that experience struggle to see themselves in existing founders. But this is not a problem for black women and other marginalized communities to solve. Black women make structural alterations to digital spheres of communication through developing standalone apps and platforms. They're early adopters, they're transformers of existing platforms, and their online content already serves as a model for other creatives. So digital Black feminism provides the historical context needed to consider the digital turn and chart Black women's longstanding relationship to communication technology as a mechanism to better understand the future of our digital world. 
The second goal of digital black feminism is to document a shift in black feminist principles and praxis and ensure that we consider digital black feminist thinkers online writing as central to the ongoing work of, liber of liberation. As Feminista Jones writes, who could have predicted that people who never set foot on a college campus, much less in a specialized journalism school, would have international audiences reading their cultural and sociopolitical analyses, or have their work be a part of a rigorous academic curriculum at universities they could never afford to attend? Black feminist thinkers have always existed outside of the academy. However, this generation's use of digital tools and social media platforms has led some to disregard their work as part of some neoliberal superstructure, devaluing what they create online. But as Brittany Cooper explains, there is still a dearth of real knowledge about Black women public intellectuals. Lifestyle blogging, natural hair tutorials, online, online snark and perfectly placed memes do not mark digital Black feminists as superficial or untethered to serious scholarship. None of these practices exclude them, and might I say us, from liberation work. They locate their spaces of retreat alongside their activist work, often entering their living by using the tools of a digital capitalist superstructure. As Cooper explains, or concludes rather, Black women are serious thinkers, and it's our scholarly duty to take them seriously. Black girls who may not code still possess knowledge of and ability to navigate digital platforms. Their relationship with digital tools and culture is changing how we view technology today. In the chapters that follow, I analyze the content of digital Black feminist thought online and the mechanisms of production and dissemination and deal with the messy complexities of a new form of feminism imbued with an ethos of digital praxis. I love that. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, and there are so many words that resonate with me, but one thing that I want to maybe start us with is the way that you talk about Black women being one, on the one hand, talking about their very specific experience, but that experience also speaking to the universal. And there is this way that we often don't afford Black women that possibility to speak from their experience and then also speak to the universal. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the examples from the book that you think really speak to that. Because I, I do see that really um, wonderfully in your work. Oh, thank you so much for that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle for those of us who study Black folks, generally Black women more specifically, Black femmes, Black non-binary folks, to be able to say two things at once, which is our experiences are worthy of inquiry all on their own without the need for constant comparison. But also, if you look to those spaces, you're going to understand the rich complexities of what is possible in a digital sphere. And I think that, you know, that hopefully is what I try to get at at the book is the both and of that, the looking at Black women just for the sake of looking at Black women, but then also understanding, understanding what beauty comes out of that and what possibilities do. Um, in, in the third chapter of the book, I deal primarily with the blogosphere. And I talk about Black women bloggers in the early 2000s leading up to like the 2010s and how that era of blogging is so underwritten about as it relates to Black folks online. That was a period of time where I was in graduate school and I was, you know, spending so much of my time away from my Black community <laughs> at work and in school. And instead I was reading about how Black folks weren't online and didn't have access to these spaces. But that wasn't how I was experiencing my world in digital culture. I was reading these blogs that were so rich and so full and had such vibrant communities. And that was a space and that is a space where I think if we look to what Black women specifically were able to do in the blogosphere, mm -hmm. it tells such an important story, one about that period in time and what the capacities were in the affordances of these platforms of blogging, what folks were able to do when they had the space to create their own worlds, to use high context to create community, to be deeply engaged with comments and commentary, to do design work on platforms that no longer required things like knowledge of HTML to participate, um, mm -hmm. that we begin to understand what's possible in these spaces without and before 
we have things like trolling and before we have things, right? So we had these really lovely spaces that people had curated a really black, a really black, a really black femme space, right? To talk about hair, to talk about mothering, to talk about dating, to talk about the things that mattered in our lives, um, but also to talk about the larger world of social issues. And so I love looking at that period because it gives us a sense of what was possible um, in that digital world and how things changed, how the um, you know rise in, in Twitter, how the rise in other social media platforms changed our relationship to those spaces and changed our capacities to kind of uh, shelter and enclave ourselves away from some of the, the online hate and harassment that followed in the years after that. So I love looking back to those places because I think it tells us so much, not like predictive about the future, but I think that looking historically is really generative for understanding where we've been and what our capacities are potentially going forward. Uh, I love that. And I plan to ask this later, but I will ask it now, which is where do you see us going? Because <laughs> I feel like um, one of the things that's so interesting about this time period that you're talking about is that it's not really, uh, there's nothing analogous now. Like yeah. you caught a particular moment in your book. And I feel similarly about like my own work, that there was mm -hmm. this moment online that we're speaking to that doesn't exist now. So I was curious if you could talk a bit about kind of what moment you think we're in right now and kind of where you think or maybe hope we might be going. I'm always hopeful about where we're going because I think because you know you and I both spend so much time looking at where we've been. And so it caught it gives me so much great hope about possibilities even when my capacities don't exist to be to predict what they look like because I wouldn't have seen most of what was coming, right? Like I wouldn't have understood the way that black folks are so creative and so inventive and so resourceful and so filled with joy in moments where we're expected not to be, right? And so I'm very hopeful about what that means about our mediated and digitized lives going forward, about our ability to, to utilize that history and that legacy and that knowledge to kind of do really creative things. I think that there's, you know, interesting things happening in spaces like TikTok right now. I swore during <laughs> pandemic, I wasn't going to write about TikTok. And of course, I've already broken that and written to <laughs> it. Can, I, feel, I, I relate. I relate. <laughs> over your life, they're like, well, I'm, I'm on here all the time anyway. I might as well write about this a little bit. But um, I think where we're going and what I've, I've been starting to write about a little bit more is like the reclamation of pleasure as like the end game, right? Like not as like a, a an aside or an addition thing, but like if we focus on like black women's expressed desire for and fight for their own pleasure, I think that that is a really interesting space to think about that and how it's going to connect with the possibilities of these new platforms. So what are black women doing when we take away the the, the monetized like uh, influencer? I mean, it, it's, it exists, right? Obviously, right. so much of our digital culture is about branding. And, and I write about that in the book, right? That kind of shift to branded content and influencer content exists. And so I guess what I'm thinking of right now is how and watching how folks who have been online for a while have gone through that phase of like monetizing their content and like yeah. shifting online and have then started to come back into like, I'm just going to be happy here again. And you all are going to deal, you know, and that I think is really profound. And it's it really harkens to hope for me of what a future looks like where we actually centralize ourselves and our own needs and desires in a world that like fights us not to do that. Oh, I love that so much. And I think one of the real beauties too of your work is that uh, line that you have because you have been there since kind of those early platforms <laughs> and you can see kind of the shift over time, which I think makes it so much more um, rich in terms of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk now, since you mentioned design, I'm also thinking, and Black women, I'm also thinking about the cover, which I just love. He's so pretty. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the cover and the title. Yeah. Like what, how, can you tell us a little bit about 
how you came to this cover and also how you came to this title. Yeah, so this cover is um, from the work of Labette Ballard, who is a brilliant, brilliant mixed media artist. Um, I saw a show of hers in Philadelphia a few years ago when I was there for a conference and was just obsessed with her work. And um, I, I asked, you know, we, we asked if we could use a piece and, and put forward. I had a couple of ideas of different pieces of, of hers, but this one was so perfect. It's called The Caretakers. And this piece is really about Black women's legacy in caretaking and the way that that manifests from birth all the way through death. And the position that other folks see Black women as their caretakers, but also the adoption of that idea as a feminist praxis, right? Like that there's this kind of duality of people seeing Black women as being the ones who are supposed to fix and supposed to make right and supposed to do good, right? And that burden that we carry because of that and that need to kind of shed that, but also the, the, the agency that's involved in reclaiming notions of caretaking as praxis, right? Of, of taking care of self, of taking care of community, of finding the, the possibility of doing both things at the same time, and how that means that sometimes we're going to have to put ourselves and our needs first. Um, so it was really such a perfect uh, encapsulation of so much of what I was trying to kind of show in that long history, that so much of our creativity and our innovation and our skill came out of forced caretaking, Right. Mm -hmm. And now has come out of like a, a reclamation of that idea of, of caretaking for the self. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that's where the, the cover art comes from. And the, the title of the book, Digital Black Feminism, um, not Black Digital Feminism, which I think is really important um, because words matter and the order of words matter, is that this book is about Black feminists. And the digital is the piece that um, changes, challenges, uh, builds upon. And so I was really tracing a legacy of Black feminist thought and Black feminist praxis and really interested in what the digital does to folks who are in that space. How do we uh, interpolate ourselves with the digital, right? In the same way that, you know, hip hop feminists write so brilliantly about what hip hop does with feminism and how Black women manage and navigate this love of hip hop and their feminist principles. So I was really interested in making sure that Black feminism was at the center of the theorizing of my method, uh, my ethics, and how I approach the women and men and non-binary folks that I write about in this text. I really wanted to make sure that I was engaging in Black feminist ideals here. And the digital, again, is the kind of the, the sprinkle on top, right? The digital is the piece that adds to this that perhaps changes it in, in ways that it won't go back to what it was before. Um, but it also was a reminder that um, if you, like I, I write about this a bit in the introduction that black feminism has this way of getting under the skin of a lot of folks, right? The big F word. And it, with outside of black communities and inside of black communities, this idea of being a feminist is, is still highly a controversial claim in a lot of circles. And I like the discomfort. I appreciate, I think it's important that we sit in the discomfort of what it means for Black women to reclaim the notion of feminism and to say with their full chest, we, we made this stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. it's not that Black feminism is some take on regular feminism. Black feminism is feminism, right? Black, because as, as we know, if we're free, then everybody else gets to be free, right? Like, so it matters that we retake this word, that we cause folks to sit in their discomfort about it, that they challenge themselves as to why it is still so disconcerting for Black women to name themselves as feminists. Um, so that's where the, the titling of the book came from. And I just thought it paired so well with what uh, Lavette Ballard did with this piece. And her work is just so amazing and so brilliant. I love to look at it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm really appreciating that connection between the ethical and I would say caretaking that you did as a writer with the people that you are interviewing or, you know, the stories that you're telling uh, in, the, in the book. And then also the image being called caretaker and thinking about those things together. Can you talk a little bit about your own caretaking that you did with uh, the people and the incidences that you write about in the book. Thank you for that. Yeah. So 
I um I wrote this without talking to the humans as a, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, pieces that I read in graduate school uh, called Don't Talk to the Humans when we were talking about ethnography. And it was a real challenge to think through how to do that in such a way um, that would still very much tell these stories as narrative that would still put forward the feeling of being in these places and experiencing things in real time. So my strategy for looking at um, what is left behind is kind of how I put it by the people that leave and the people that leave it behind rather than mm -hmm. seeing texts as things that are divorced from the humans that create them, which I think it's very easy for us to do in digital spaces um, where things are not already created and put into an archive or into a collection where we're forced to kind of think about who wrote it and what year and how it happened. But texts just kind of start circulating and then you forget whoever said it, right? So it was a really important task for me to connect everything that I wrote about to the human beings that were writing about it and to sit with their work um, for years, actually, right? Like to not do this kind of scraping method where I picked up a bunch of what was happening that had a key term, but maybe missed out on the context of how this was said and what was going on with that person that day when they made this claim or made this statement or posted this picture. And in that way, really trying to do as, as much service as possible to their intention um, and to, and there's things I didn't post or didn't write about for that reason, right? Because I saw that it was part of something that they probably didn't want to be reflected in a book, right? Or that it may have been a really great quote, but it was not the context, right? Like that's not what they were talking yeah. about that day. They were actually expressing something else, but that quote could have worked if I pulled it into this space. And there's just ways that you don't know that unless you're there. And so I'm like deeply grateful for the kind of field work and ethnographic approaches to research that remind us not that we're gonna become someone else through our work, but that one, like our positionality matters, like being a part of these blogging communities, a genuine part of them, um, someone, a person who got something out of these experiences, right, who was actually there because I liked being there and not because it was a research project um, and being there for years, you know, really mm -hmm. made a difference in feeling as though I could begin to try at this ethical place of caretaking the humans and their work. So really caring about what they left behind um, and seeing it as valuable and treating it as though it was a sacred thing that I was able to interact with them about. I love that. And again, this is something we don't talk about enough, I think, as researchers, the kind of consideration that we take for the people we work with? How are we thinking about the impact of our scholarly production on their lives after we have our wonderful book moment? Um, I'm gonna read just a, a piece. This is from uh, Principles for Digital Black Feminism. And you say, digital black feminism creates complicated allegiances between black men and black women, wherein a blog titled Very Smart Brothers can be a conduit for, for enclaved black feminist discourse. I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, because I feel I, like- I, Yeah, I was I gonna say, I like always that, the USBs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that's such a, I think that's an important part of what your work does is it, shows people where there's black feminist content where they might not be not expect it. Yeah, I so I am I'm literally always happy to talk about VSBs because it it was my favorite blog. Um, <laughs> and and David and Panama have been so gracious throughout this, you know, writing process and experience. And watching and tracking the journey of that particular blog, I think could have been a whole book, like easily. Mm -hmm. Um the work that those two writers have done to create a space, an enclave space of discourse, a, a black communal discourse was so magnificent to see in real time that like I had to start writing about it years ago. And, and I wrote about it first as just like what it meant to be a part of the black blogosphere and how they you know navigated that. But as it came time to write digital black feminism, I had to really think about um, where this fits into a conversation about Black women and about Black feminist ethos, right? Like, so 
these are folks who I would 100% say write uh, about Black feminist topics who come from a perspective where they are not only celebratory of Black women, but they are very uh, aware of how, they're very aware of how their work gets elevated even when they're writing the same thing that Black women are writing about. And so you kind of can watch that allegiance form where folks are willing to take a back seat even in their own space, in their own blog, um, in order to make it clear who came up with this idea, who they're citing, why it's mm -hmm. important that they're citing them. And so I, I really enjoyed writing about this, this piece on allegiances because one, I think it's a, it's an age old thing, right? So it's, this is nothing new again, that like black women and black men have found this complicated way to, to work together and to, and I think black women to recognize the places where we don't and to recognize mm -hmm. the places where we've got to work against folks who are supposed to be working with us sometimes. Um, and this blog was a really great way to think through what that looks like uh, a blog that's, um, written by, that's authored by two Black men, two cis hetero Black men, right, um, who then challenge themselves more and more and more over the years mm -hmm. to develop, um, one, spaces to incorporate the actual voices of other folks, right, but also challenge their own perspectives, um, write about what it looks like to challenge themselves, write about what it looks like to be wrong and to sit in the discomfort of that, um, and I also really appreciated writing about that complicated allegiances with Very Smart Brothers because that blog also gave us a really great window into what it looks like when Black discursive practice gets taken up by the mainstream. What happens when it becomes profitable to be writing about Black folks online? And mm -hmm. we watched this go from a very small blog to something that gets you know, uh, bought by the root, right? And what it means to have something taken under that umbrella and the kind of space that that opens up from a what was a small enclave community into now a space where we're getting the same kind of vitriol and hatred that every other Black writer is getting <laughs> when they're publishing in mainstream sources. So it's this duality, right, of like this allegiance that they make with Black women, but also that they make with this larger media network. And mm -hmm. the give and take that happens there, the places that overlap and the places where that allegiance can cause harm, can cause real harm to that community of, of readers, to them as writers and, and as human beings as well. So, I mean, I, I often joke, like, they're the only men I write about in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some of my favorites. Um, so I really yeah. um, always look to them as a, a guidepost. And I think what's happened with their careers has just been indicative of, of what they've done intentionally to create that kind of space. And it's just taken their careers off in really great ways. Yes. And what I appreciate, too, about what you track here and even what you're just saying is that this was the evolution, things changed over time. So I'm, I'm curious too about what you think time is doing. Like um, not that it's, it's clear that you're talking about it, but it's not linear in like a progressive sense, right? right like there's, right. there's trade-offs for a bigger platform and then there's, but there's, you know, things that come with that. Yeah. So I'm just curious about how you're thinking about, you know, how time has changed some of some of these uh, people and their platforms. I think it's so interesting how cyclical, you know, these things are in addition to that kind of like watching things progress over like in a linear way, because the repetition of that kind of pattern of uh Black folks gathering in small, quiet spaces, these enclave spaces, them turning into what Catherine Squires would call like a counter public space, right? Where they now have this access and this platform and more people paying attention, potentially more funding, right? Like this can manifest in a lot of ways. We watch it happen in movements very frequently. We've watched it happen with Black meat, with other Black media platforms, frankly. Like, so if we want to take like a media studies perspective and think about you know, BET networks and other black owned network. We've watched it happen with black magazines and black newspaper. So there's a very like media studies kind of thing that's happening in terms of that cycle. But it's a broader, I think, cultural thing that happens as well when it becomes popular to be a black writer, to be a black scholar, to be a black author, um, when the work of the movement becomes popularized and potentially commodified, right? Because anything that becomes that popular then becomes profitable to someone. And so that's what we've watched happen with Black feminism online for sure. Absolutely. And we've reached this moment where it's profitable in some ways 
to be a black feminist. For some people. To, yeah. be a, to be a black feminist writer can make you a lot of money in some circles, right? And so that matters, but we do have windows to what that's looked like in the past. We do have mm -hmm. windows to movement leaders who have gotten uh, you know, their work taken up by broader audiences, what that's meant for the watering down of said work or what that's meant mm -hmm. for uh, the amount of money that they could make doing that work and how that's translated to how big the audience is, how tight the community can be and the effectiveness of their organizing strategies. Right. So I think that there's this interesting time thing that definitely it's this progression. Right. Like and we're watching it happen. But then we're just kind of watching the cycle repeat again and again and again. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. You know, uh, we sometimes think, oh, we're repeating our mistakes or re repeating the problem. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who was talking about like a, a blues epistemology and this idea that we have that things must always be advancing and like progressing, but like some things are supposed to stop, right? Yeah. Like some things are supposed to end. Like there's a, there's a way that um, we can be crafty and like kind of shift here and there and, and try to propel things forward, but like everything's not supposed to go that way. Things are supposed to sometimes come to a come to an end and to a conclusion, and I think that that's true with movements. I think that that's true with leadership. I think that's true with our writing and with our mediums as well. And it's not always a sad thing. It's you know maybe a, a look back and like nostalgic thing. Like I miss VSBs, but it's 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 wound down, right? Like official, yeah. it's official. Yeah. Down. And it and it's a beautiful thing in a lot of ways how it's come to a conclusion where the folks who were so intimately involved with it are able to keep going into the next stage of what they're going to do. Absolutely. So like giving, I think that also gives me a little hope in terms of our own bit of nostalgia and our work for certain times and moments, right? Like it was good, but we also don't know what's coming next. And That's right. Like maybe leave room for what that might look like. That's right. Um, I want to turn now. This is on. This is just language that I really like that you use. And you say, I use the word stitching and threading to consider the piecing together of one's work as a Black feminist writer with one's personal life. Stitching and threading evoke two acts of, of import for Black women. Twitter threads and the physical threads and stitches used in the process of sewing and quilting. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about, about what that brought up for you and also kind of what you what stitching and threading means to you now. Yeah. So I, you know, I start out at the beginning of the book talking about like women's work and, and black women's work and how the labor of black womanhood becomes detached and divorced from the terminologies of expertise and, and technology and skill and kind of put into categories of things like uh, like hobbies and, and home and domesticity. And I talk about how that's like a really intentional like rhetorical shift, right? Like that's not happenstance like, oh, how did that occur? Very mm -hmm. intentionally that happens, right? Yeah. And so toward the end of the book, then I, I try to bring that back and thinking about um, how the, the work that is done by women in, in lots of areas of life um, has this important quality, not only of what it provides to other people, what we actually create, you know, so stitching and threading is this thing that is a, a tool of making something, of making a blanket, of making a quilt, right, of, of creating something that provides comfort and care for someone else. But that sometimes in that process of, of talking about the quilting and the weaving, we don't actually think about the skill set that's necessary, the, the actual activity, the praxis of the thing. And so I, I use those terms stitching and threading in that chapter on praxis, just like using publishing or capturing to really sit in the activity rather than in the product of it. Because sometimes we think of folks as only being as good as what they provide to us, right? Like they're provide, Black women are great in so much as they're a key voting population and they, and they hand us this election. Or Black women are great in so much as they provide us this service, this good, they created this thing that we really like, this aesthetic. Um, but what about the activity? What is it like to be a person involved in the action of stitching and threading? And what does that do for the person who's doing it? And what does that do, you know, it, how does that change the relationship that the person has with the tools and the actual physical things that they're touching and holding? So in that part I, of, the, of the text, I, I talk about Ida B. Wells, Barnett, and I talk about 
the life of stitching and threading together one's personal and very public uh, kind of mobilization efforts, right? And what it means to kind of have to uh, put yourself out of the picture, to take away pieces of yourself or to recognize that if I stitch this in, if I am my full self, that my work won't be taken seriously. And it was a part of the book where I was uh, really happy to see digital black feminists who, who are refusing that, right? Refusing this idea that I can't be a very full version of myself publicly and be an activist, right? Like that I will be a parent or I will be um, into BDSM or whatever it is. Like I'm gonna do me and I'm going to be an activist. And I have to stitch those pieces of myself together because it makes me better at this thing that you want me to do, right? Or it's the only way I get fulfillment myself out of doing this thing that you want me to do. And I think we really see that in the work of um, Jamila Lemieux, for example, who writes herself into these documents, these really well-researched, really well-articulated documents, um, for example, about the R. Kelly, um, you know, uh, scandal, but writes about herself and her own experience in the city of Chicago into that um, in ways that Ida B. Wells refuses to do, right? Refuses to say that I'm going to write myself into this because you won't take me seriously. I'm going to write this as a journalist. And Lemieux says, no, like this is my journalism. This is my trained professional journalism still requires this of me um, so that I can be full and free, but so also that you recognize how this work connects to me as a person. Mm -hmm. And I think you touch on that yourself kind of in the introduction by saying a little bit about kind of your journey to writing this book. Can you maybe say a bit about what it was like to kind of put the little pieces of you that you stitched in to the book? Were, what, did that make you uh, nervous or how did you feel about that as a, a Black woman in the academy sort of writing writing your truth and your understanding of this work? Well, I'm really glad I didn't get this book done when I was supposed to, I think, because I don't know that it would look the way that it does. I don't know that I would have had, um, if I would have felt like I could do that in, in the way that I did. And so I think a lot of that comes from, you know, beginning to believe that that is acceptable, right? Like to, to be fully present in your work which so many of us are taught is not like so early in our academic training, we're taught to write ourselves out. Even if we're not doing like, you know, a social scientific objectivist research, even when we're doing like the, the deep readings and the ethnographic work, we're taught that our way of talking, our way of writing isn't quite right, that we have to modify it in some way for it to be acceptable. Um, and I, I had a lot more freedom, I think, having waited uh, a couple years past when I was supposed to write this book um, to, to be able to feel like, you know, that my voice was actually okay, just as it was. That um, the way that I speak to folks is actually an okay way to write too. Mm -hmm. um, that the kinds of pop culture references that resonate for me will resonate for other people. And you know what, if they mm -hmm. don't, they can look them up. The same way that I have to look up the references that people make to parts of the Americana, you know, experience that do not resonate for me. I remember sitting in grad school and having like a whole class of people kind of laugh and joke about music or shows or things that I had no idea what they were talking about and having like make a note when you get home, look up, you know, this rock group or look up whatever. And so there are very intentional parts of the book where I don't explain parts of black culture where I'm just like, if you don't know what this is, you should probably go look it up because that's on you to do, right? Yes. Um, and, and so that I think is is where pieces of me come in, is like, I, this is actually an okay reference. This is, a, this is a pretty good metaphor. It makes sense in my head. It's gonna make sense in someone else's head too. Um, but yeah, there were pieces, there were parts where I was very aware that I was doing that. And then there are parts where I was very not aware. <laughs> and it's been pointed out to me since, and people are like, that's how you talk. And I'm like, it, yes. I'm so glad that you say that because I did want to talk about your wonderful headings in your oh, titles yeah. of chapters because you do that. Like, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny how money changes situation. And then also you have one in here. I mean, you have many. But <laughs> you, you are the prototype. And so just like little, little nods to... My like, heart belongs to Andre 3000. I mean, like, so, I know. He's you know, they matter to me. <laughs> I mean, they, they, 
they matter because they're how I, they're actually how I thought about it. There weren't yeah. some clever like thing to come up with afterwards. When I heard, when I was listening to Lauren Hill rap while I was writing this and she's saying, it's funny how money changes situation, miscommunication leads to complicate. I was like, exactly. And that's about digital black balance. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that, you know, that's the way my brain picked it up. And I, I did have to have a conversation with, with, with some editors who thought that double, you know, chapter heading, is that really what you want to do? Like, I mean, I know that it's funny how much, like, is that really, I'm like, it really is. It really is the chapter heading. Like, I'll keep the other part, what explains what it is, because I understand how search algorithms work and that people need to know what the chapter is about. I get it. But like, <laughs> but also that's the piece of it that felt most real to me, that felt the most mm -hmm. true to what I was actually trying to say. It's also probably a product of being the daughter of a, of a preacher, right? Who <laughs> incorporated these things into sermons very frequently. Uh, uh, that PK mindset. Right. <laughs> ways, you know, they're, they're hard to let go of. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, this, I think, takes me to my last question because I'm looking at time and want to make sure that we have time for questions from other people. How are you thinking about um, kind of that tension between explaining things and not explaining things? And we've talked about this very briefly, but just, you know, there's a way that the digital makes so much of our intimate culture very public in ways that really makes me anxious and nervous and I don't like it. Yeah. And then there are some things about it that are really beautiful and like I love the way that like young black people are using TikTok to share kind of these intimate things that really resonate with us for people who grew up in spaces with black folk um, that are just so powerful. But also- I don't want everybody you know, to know about it. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah. How, how, how are you? How are you feeling about that? How are you? Yeah. I think we're in a shared headspace on this. I think it's challenging, and I think it, it's something that I think about and talk through with caught like other Black academics who write about this very frequently. I think when we started out writing, there was so much less tension about this for me because I felt like we were fighting to be seen in this space. Yeah. Right? Like mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure we weren't going to be overlooked. There is an interesting things happening here. This is a, there's a complexity to our language. There's a complexity complexity to our culture. There's a complexity to our digital praxis. And we were kind of arguing for that. And I've realized, you know, we were arguing to white folks for that, right? We were, we were saying, please notice, like, please pay attention here. Please include us in your literature. And I think that our, our perspective has broadly changed. I don't feel like that's the aim anymore to my work, right? Like it, it's, it's not a, I want you to pay attention. We're here. We're important anymore. Um, I write about one, things that bring me joy because I really think that that's important as a writer, right? As, it, especially as a writer, a, a person who writes about black culture is to continue to write about the spaces that bring joy and to find the arguments and how to uh, have arguments resonate in ways that um, challenge us as a society to really think critically and carefully about still how we assign things like expertise, because it does matter that we rightly position folks in their expertise if we want there to be demonstrable change to these digital spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in things like harm reduction. And so I believe that it is important that um, Black folks set the table in these places, not get a seat, but actually have the capacity to reset frameworks and reset ideals in spaces where it really matters. And in order to do that, we do have to keep writing about ourselves in these spaces. I, I think that we have to be very attuned to how our writing can cause harm. And still seeing, as we talked about a little bit earlier today, right, still seeing the folks we write about as people and not as, as data points and not as arguments that we're making, but as human beings. I, I just finished another piece about TikTok um, <laughs> a few days ago, and I was citing um, this Black content creator who was talking about, um, you know, appropriation and 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 uh, mimetic content on TikTok, and just had like this really brilliant kind of uh, thing that he did, and um, I I just messaged him and I was like, hey, I'm writing this piece, and what do you think about this? Is it okay if I cite you? Is it okay if I point back to your work on this? 
IRB says yes, by the way, right? Like <laughs> they, mm -hmm. you know, the, the review boards say it's totally fine to do that. He has a very public account. He's a check mark, mm -hmm. like everything, right? right? But it felt like a thing where I wanted to make sure it was okay if this got yeah. shared outside of my For You page, right? Like I knew I was supposed to see it, but I wanted to make sure he wanted a lot yeah. of people to know that he, he was like, yes, but cite me. I said, always, right? Um, and yeah. So, that's the kind of back and forth that I think is important is is really seeing what folks intention is with their work, that there are a lot of content creators who want their work to be widely seen and cited. Um, and there are folks who don't want their work to to go as far as it does. We can't ever assume that because people are on a public platform, they think millions of people are going to they want millions of people to see their content or that they have thought through the consequences of millions of people seeing their content. And so that's where that caretaking comes back in again. It, it is not my job to know better than people know for themselves, but it is my job to treat folks the way that I hope people would treat my content. Any of us who's ever had a tweet that like didn't land well and got circulated and we got a lot of hate for, we recognize that like even when we're doing these things in public spaces, that stuff can go left. And, and so I just try to carry that as much as possible in the work I do. And it makes it more challenging for sure. But it also, I think you, you sleep a little better at the end of the day, having done it. I love that. I love that. So I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, please feel free to drop your questions into the ask the question. and let us know what's on your mind. Oh, I see folks I know in the chat. Hi. <laughs> oh, we got a question. Your work is so wonderful for emerging scholars and writers. I wonder if you have any advice for grad students who are simultaneously trying to find their voice and do solid work that shakes the table and isn't concerned with gaining white recognition. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, so the first thing is to just keep writing, like to keep writing and keep writing and keep writing, because I think finding your voice in your writing for me takes a long, it took a long time. And so even when I was at a stage where I felt like I was doing good work, when I look back at some of the things that I was writing, then I, I kind of cringe a little that things, things that get heavily cited. And I think I wasn't, that wasn't a true voice for me. Like that was me like trying to get into that particular journal to do that particular thing. And I think, fortunately, I think, and it is a privilege and I recognize it as such, is that sometimes now I get to just write and see if anybody wants to publish it and not actually care as much. Like, you know, um, and there is a there is a privilege that's associated with that. And so my advice to graduate students is to just keep writing, to read a lot of work that is outside of your disciplinary home so that you are not trying to reinvent the wheel or feel as though you have to start from scratch in your work. And instead, you can begin to ask the questions that you actually care about, because I think a lot of the validating and the need for validation that we have comes from feeling like no one else has done this before. So I have to position this as brand new and whatever. And I think it's much more interesting to do the building work. So when we see that other folks are doing things, saying I'm going to grow this area by adding to it rather than by chopping it down and saying this is terrible. No one's done this. I think that that inclination is so far divorced from black feminist praxis, right? Like the, the need that we're taught, which is to critique and to challenge everything that we're read. This is wrong. Let me tell you why it has gaps and holes and it's missing things. And I think shifting the mentality, like here's where we can build together. Here's where what you wrote, like really beautifully pairs with what I've written. And I think that those things will find a home in, in scholarship, but we also have to start thinking about ways to get our work out that doesn't follow the, the traditional academic uh, writing standard, because you're right. There's a lot of that writing that requires us to seek validation from from certain sources and not others. Well said. Uh, this is a another question. You are ethnographers and academics. Do you have any spaces where you boost connections and community gathering among us non academics who are reading this book? Oh, okay. So like actual spaces. 
you know, follow us on Twitter because most of what I talk about there is not academic. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I think that we build like really brilliant community that is both folks who are in the academy and folks who are just interested in the work, um, public scholars, public writers, you know, there's a wonderful kind of, of back and forth that, that still happens on Twitter. Not, it's not like it used to be, but can still happen there. Um, other things that we're doing. So I'm teaching a class this upcoming semester called Intro to Digital Studies. And my students don't know this yet. They're going to find out on Monday. So if they're uh, watching, surprise, they're going to be creating a public facing way to interact in that class for folks who are registered and not, right? So that we can read together, we can have discussions together, we can post our ideas, they can share during class sessions and, and live tweet along with us as we read and, and, and grow our ideas alongside one another and find ways to publish things that are not traditional academic work, but are in short form so that they're more easily consumable by folks who are not sitting in a, a three hour you know, seminar. And so I think those are the kinds of things that I hope we do more of. I would love to hear you answer that too, Moya. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think for me, it's been Allied Media Projects in Detroit. Like that's been my home away from home from academia and has really been a source where I think lots of people who care about the world generally can get together in a way that is also thinking about the digital and how the digital can maybe help us create the world we want and um, yeah, it definitely is a place where academics are not at the center. And there's an understanding that academics are not the ones who are going to save us, right. uh, which I think is an important thing to say. Academics do good work, but that's, that's not necessarily all of the work or, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We recognize the small corner of the, of the universe that we're in. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so another question for you. How has writing this book impacted your personal digital activism and what you decide to be public or mainstream or oh, private? That's a good question. I just did a radio interview last week and the person doing the interview was like, I tried to tag you on Instagram, but like your Instagram's private. I was like, sure is, and always will be. <laughs> and so I was like, no, you have to promote your book there. I was like, that's okay. Um, like my Twitter's public, my Instagram will forever be private because I need a place where I actually know the folks that I'm talking to so I can say more things and post different kinds of pictures. Um, and I think it's so important. Uh, and that's a lesson, I think, from the, the book and from the folks in that book, in the book, is that the way that people have so carefully curated the different kinds of platforms and what pieces of themselves they intentionally choose to share is not a problem. Like it's not a bad thing that people are that aware that this space is for this and this space is for that. We have always done that. The version of myself that my parents got when I was growing up was different than the people at school got, was different than my teachers got, was different than, you know, so we've always done that. We've always had to do that. All people do that, right? But especially Black folks have had to do that in terms of the version of ourselves that we share at work with our work colleagues and friends and the version that comes home with us, right? Um, and so this is the same kind of thing. And I think it reinforced for me the need to have these very clear boundaries um, in my, my digital presence and what I do. Um, as it relates to, to activism, I reserve that title for folks who are doing far more than myself. And, and, and I think that it's important that we do that to what Moya just said. I am an academic. I am a writer. I do care very deeply about causes. And I very much hope that my work inspires folks to do the really important on the ground work. Like that's why I do the writing. But I am under no false auspices that my work is that. You know, it is. And so uh, I get talks and people like talk about your activism. I was like, I am a, a, a thinker and a writer that lives in a really privileged position to be able to do that. Right. To, to live this life where I just get to think and write and think very carefully. But I really hope that the work I do is part of this larger process because folks need inspiration points and they need the theory. Right. Like the theory matters because people it does. and they do things with it. So that's where I, I continue to position myself and, and hope that my work is, is an inspiring piece of someone's larger journey. I love that. And here's 
the last question, which is, I think, speaking really specifically to uh, part of the book, can you briefly expand on how you came up with the virtual beauty shop? As an aside, it also brought up for me the multiple live stream videos I've seen of actual beauty shops, salons on TikTok. Oh, I was just having, I'm trying to think of who I was talking to the other day about this. They might be on this on this live stream right now um, about um, the change in the beauty shop and like beauty shop cultures shift, right? And so, and how, oh, I think it was Andre Brock who's on here that we were having this chat about like how influencer culture and Instagram has really changed like what beauty shops are, right? Because it's now someone's chair that they rent like in a suite, right? And it's just yes. that person, which is very different than it was. 15 years ago when you went to get your hair done. Um, but the virtual beauty shop for me arose out of the digital barber shop um, because I wrote about the digital barber shop as my dissertation research, actually. And I was writing about the Black blogosphere. And when I came to the end of writing that dissertation on the Black blogosphere, I had to name this document. And I named it the barber shop because of this kind of space that it sat in of, of being kind of an enclave whilst kind of promoting this discourse that was about counter publics. But I, it, it didn't sit well with me that I named it the digital barber shop because my inspiration for that dissertation were the Black women bloggers that I was reading in graduate school. But when it came time to name that, I named it the barbershop because that was the metaphor that people understood about Black discourse. Like barbershops are everywhere on television and in media, right? People understand the cultural significance of the Black barbershop. But when I got to the end of it, I was like, but this really wasn't about the barbershop. Like that wasn't, mm -hmm. that's not exactly what I was doing. And so I decided to really think through what it would mean to have instead written about the beauty shop. How would that have changed what I did with that dissertation, right? And so instead of kind of just turning that into a book, I rethought the idea of the shop and shop culture and what it meant for Black women to be the proprietors of a space that belonged to them and that was for them and was never created for white folks, was never intended for, for white people to participate in, to make money from, to, to gain anything from, and how few spaces get to exist like that for Black women. And so the, the import of that um, let alone all of the metaphors about hair care and technology that, that get woven into the book. But that beginning place of like, what would it mean to have really written about a space that Black women created completely for themselves and had the autonomy to create something that was about what they wanted, what they liked, right? Where it was not about what someone was telling them to do. Um, and to just to shine in that space and to, to develop all kinds of skills that were, again, helpful for other Black women. Um, and the complications that come with with black hair and black hair culture and and doing hair and what it means to do hair for yourself that still in some ways is performative for whiteness, right? So it, it just you know it landed there, <laughs> and I sat with it for quite a while, and that's where that's where the the virtual beauty shop comes from. Thank you so much. I also I think let me just see there might be one last question we can sneak in. Ah, uh, and this is this will be our, our real last question. Okay. I'd like to discuss and highlight black sex workers in the digital space and the challenges they face at work, such as shadow banning. Absolutely. What are some things writers should consider when discussing highly censored topics such as black feminism and human sexuality? That's such a great question. Um, as I was finishing writing the book, I, I was talking to a friend and saying the thing that I, I didn't and couldn't write about in this book was exactly that was black sex workers, because it would have required a, an entirely different kind of approach in terms of making sure that folks were able to write their own work. If I were to do that kind of work, I, it would be really important to me that people were writing with me. Um, mm -hmm for lots of reasons, um, so that I was not making assumptions about what was acceptable for me to write about and not because of all the complex layers that come into play there. I think that that is a place that needs much more attention, but I think that we should not assume, I, I do not assume that I'm the best person to write about that because I can only live so much in that space as someone who's not a sex worker, right? Like, and so I can assist other folks in their journey of writing this through, but I think it's such a ripe space to think about ingenuity and creativity, um, living right alongside fear and, and you know, all these other things and how those are living together for the lives of black sex workers who are navigating these, dis who 
are brilliantly, by the way, navigating digital platforms all the time to continuously, one, uh, for labor reasons, to do their work, right, to stay safe, but also to but also in this space of pleasure that I'm so interested in, right? And how people are navigating the, the dichotomies and complexities and overlaps of those things. So I'm excited to see what, what you do with that. Um, so the name of person, Mackenzie. I'm excited to see what you do with that. I think what, think what people need to really consider is the extent to which you can be sure that your work is not doing folks harm and how you can make for certain that especially in those cases, you are not causing harm to the folks that you are intentionally trying to work alongside. And so I think that's one of those areas where I would be really, really um, strongly thinking about writing with folks and making sure that folks have full access to what I'm doing um, if I'm gonna be writing down the things that they're doing online. Wonderful. Thank you so much to everyone for all of your wonderful questions. Thank you, Catherine, for taking the time and letting me share in this wonderful work. I'm gonna invite ER back for closing. Um, thank you both so much for um, sharing this work and celebrating it with us. We want to encourage folks who are watching at home, if you would like to buy a copy of Digital Black Feminism, to just click this teal button right at the bottom of your screen right there. Um, it really does help us when you buy the event books directly from Karis. Um, we encourage you to also ask your local public library to carry this book. So our co-sponsor tonight is the Auburn Avenue Research Library. But any library in your area, um, let them know that you would like it. And also, obviously, if you're affiliated with a, a academic institution, let them know, because that's a big part of getting the word out is making sure that librarians know there's a demand um, for the book, because we want it to be a big success. We want it to go far and we want it to be canon. So um, let's let's get it in all those places. So um, thanks to everybody watching at home. Thanks to Auburn Avenue, as always, for holding it down in the chat and um, in general with us. I hope that you both stay safe and well. Um, and one day we'll get to hang out in, yeah. in physical space again. But um, until then, it's uh, it's been great to celebrate both of your books in the last year. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you both very much. That's wonderful. Good night. Can I